what we thought we would do, what we thought we would start the presentation with is kind of gauging our audience a little bit mm -hmm. and your experience and so that we can make this presentation as helpful as possible. So um, how many of you are graduate students, um, like GAs or TAs? Okay, and how many of you have, uh, are teaching um, more than one class? All, all of you are teaching one class then this okay. semester, okay? And then how many of you have been teaching um, students at the university between zero and five years? Okay, and how many would you say between five and ten years? Okay? Okay, and I want to ask, how many online classes? Okay. One. Okay. One. Okay, this just helps us figure mm -hmm. out, like, who's on first which yes. is my new technique. After five years at UNM, I've decided you should always start with figuring out who's who. Who are we speaking to? Took me five years to figure that one out. Okay, <laughs> um, so I think what we'll do is, um, what we thought we would do is we would start with just explaining our areas, the resources that we have, um, some of the things that we think we can help you with, and then uh, what we thought we would do is go into, leave a lot of time for hypotheticals or questions and answers. So if you've had a particularly problematic situation that you've experienced and you were stumped on how to handle it, um, this is a, a, an excellent panel to help you problem solve. Um, so if you don't have those, then we can give you some hypotheticals of things that we've encountered mm -hmm. lately that we've seen faculty members and professors kind of struggle with. Right. Um, so we thought we'd start with Lisa because she has to leave early today. Um, so take it away. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, it's really nice to be here. Um, my name is Lisa Lindquist, not to be confused with Linda Lindquist, <laughs> mm. um, who actually I don't think is a real person, but everyone calls me Linda. Yes. So I won't respond anymore if you do. <laughs> um, I think the first thing I want to say is in terms of support for students, you are not alone. Mm -hmm. Right. I think we can all acknowledge the fact mm -hmm. that it's been this semester mm -hmm. in particular right. has felt really challenging um, with regard to student support um, outside of the classroom and in some cases inside of the classroom. So I know you all feel a large measure of that. So mm -hmm. I just want to talk to you a little bit about the Lobo Respect Advocacy Center, the services that we provide and how we can maybe be helpful to you all. First of all, how many of you are familiar with the Lobo Respect Advocacy Center? Good. That's good. And how many of you know us as with regard to Title IX? Do how many of you know us with regard to not Title IX? Yeah. We've become the sexual assault prevention hub, which is great. Um, that's one of the primary missions of our office. But in addition to that, um, we also do a variety of services and provide a variety of services to our students. So let's talk a little bit about Title IX and, and what that looks like. Um, in general, at this time, most <coughs> everybody on campus is considered a mandatory reporter for a Title IX incident. That is anything sexual misconduct related. So if a student, any of your students come to you and they want to have that conversation regarding maybe I've missed a lot of class and I'm getting worried or I know I missed an exam or whatever that looks like, they might disclose to you that they have been involved in some sort of sexual misconduct incident in the recent time or even maybe in the past that has been triggered. Um, you have two options in that, in that case, which I'm sure you know. You can either say, look, ha happy to hear what you have to say and also want to let you know that I do have to report this to OEO and if I report it to OEO you don't even necessarily have to respond you don't even have to re respond to OEO right so it just mm -hmm. can be there um, or I can talk to you about going to a confidential reporting location and you can discuss the issues with them openly and receive support services either way it's always a good idea to refer your student to one of our confidential reporting locations because students are entitled to receive support services, regardless of whether they've reported it to OEO, whether they've told you or they haven't told you, um, any of those things. Um, at a confidential reporting location, we're, we have, in my center, we have five advocates. Um, at Women's Resource Center, we have two advocates, and at LGBTQ Resource Center, we have one advocate. So there are confidential advocates across campus. Um, 
In general, all support that happens of an academic nature, so what we would call maybe an accommodation, um, is going to come through the Lobo Respect Advocacy Center, regardless of, a, of who a student sees for advocacy. So we work very closely with WRC especially and LGBTQ to make sure that those accommodations are happening. Um, things that you might get from us are just sort of like a, a notice that says, this student is working with our center in an ad, and we are serving as their advocate or someone is serving as their advocate and they're just looking for some flexibility and for some understanding as they deal and go through the semester in the, you know, in the aftermath of a Title IX incident. That means, and I say very clearly in my communication to you all, that means they don't have to disclose to you the details of what happened and you do not have to report it. Those will usually come under the subject header of confidential, so you know that it just stops there, but you are aware that the words Title IX are an indication to you that you need to be thinking thoughtfully about that. Now, I, I think it's really important to clarify that what we're not saying is, yeah, you absolutely have to do exactly what the student is requesting, because here's what we know. Flexibility is really important, but also maybe this student um, I just was dealing with a situation where the faculty, prior to all of, all of the situation, she said, yeah, but she hasn't been coming to class at all, and I really can't, there's no way for her to make up the work because she's missed everything. Well, in that case, then we would go back, as long as we have good communication with you all, we would go back to the student and say, look, in this particular class, an accommodation is not going to be reasonable but let's talk about what those other options are. A withdraw, so there's no impact, so it's not an F, right? And usually, and in this case, the student was like, oh yeah, I meant to drop that class and I never did. So usually there's a reasonable explanation for that, right? Mm -hmm. But it also could be that a student hasn't been attending class simply because they haven't been able to get out of bed, mm -hmm. right? And dealing with you all sometimes feels very challenging because you never want to be the person that's like not doing their work and not going to class and not trying to be successful. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. Um, so that's a level of what we do. So in general, our, our conversations with you are going to be around some sort of specific or general of ask for flexibility and accommodation. Mm -hmm. Moving on from that, we also provide a variety of services for students outside of the Title IX realm. Well, actually I should say both inside and outside of the Title IX realm. We usually describe ourselves as the people who deal with sort of crisis management for students, and crisis can be anything. I mean, for some students, crisis is my parent passed away this semester. For others, it's my work schedule changed, and I don't know what I'm going to do, like I can't attend class. In those cases, we'll talk to students about potential semester withdrawals, tuition refund appeals, scholarship petitions, <coughs> impacts on financial aid, impact um, to them on scholarship, and all, all of that. So we have a wide variety of services um, that we can use to support students. So when you're thinking about if a student's come to you and they're feel, it feels crisis, it feels fever pitch for them, you don't need to worry about resolving that problem for them. You just need to get them connected to services because then we know the questions to ask to make sure that there's not a, you know, something that happens really that negatively impacts them going forward. Mm -hmm. Does all that make sense? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, I think the other piece that, of course, I have to say is that we are the keepers of the gray area training. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> It's been not fun at all. Um, <clears throat> we, um, as you know, uh, undergrads, grads, uh, and grad students, um, and faculty, all are, and staff are all required to do mandatory training. Uh, the gray area training is specifically for undergrads, and I think it's important, I'm just going to use this opportunity to say that there are two types of undergrad or graduate training. There is an in-person, which is the gray area, and there's also an online training. It's important to know that students who are existing students, everybody had to do an in-person training. So if you haven't done your training, 
you should do your training. And you would either take graduate level training or <coughs> professional level training, depending on your department or college. Um, but there's confusion around it. So if you ever have questions about the gray area training or the online think about it training, please call our office so we can help clear that up because we know that you all are doing a great job of letting people know that this is happening, but some misinformation is out there around who needs to take what. And so bless their hearts, we've had at least, we've had several students, at least 100 who've taken this darn thing in person like three times. And I'm like, dude, well. <laughs> stop the madness. Let's move on from that. So oh, wow. just to let you know that uh, the gray area training is something that you can reach out to our office about and also in future semesters, the online training. Mm -hmm. I think that's all I have. Mm -hmm. can, can I add one tip just to augment what she said? Um, a lot of professors have talked to us and they've said, well, how do I navigate that conversation with the student if they make a disclosure? And one thing that many professors have told us that was helpful was that they start the semester off with just a disclosure that they are a mandatory reporter. So some professors choose to put that in their syllabus. Some professors choose to make a statement about it at the beginning of the semester. The other thing that I would recommend if you do something like that <clears throat> is to think about um, our LGBTQ community, which is a particularly vulnerable community. And one of the things that I would like to talk to you today about is some of the additional training, if I were in your shoes, that I would want to have based on the type of problems we see. And one of that would be the safe zone training offered by the LGBTQ Resource Center. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one that I went to that I thought was excellent was Transgender 101, which mm -hmm. was offered by the Trans Resource Center. Mm -hmm. Those are free trainings. You can sign up for them online. And then if you go through the safe zone training, you can put the little logo on your syllabus. Mm -hmm. And it lets people know in your class that you've been trained, you're a safe space, you're an ally and they feel a little bit more comfortable talking to you. So the reason why I recommend, strongly recommend putting that information in your syllabus is our whole goal is to give students and survivors as much agency as possible, right? Mm -hmm. So they can choose what, if they make a disclosure and who they make a disclosure to, how that works. So if you mm -hmm. give them notice, that would help. Um, mm -hmm. So I would just add to no, that. That's, a, that's right. a great, that's an excellent point. The whole, and I think it's really important just to touch on the Title IX piece and the potential investigation piece. The whole point is we want our students, we want students to, at the very least, get some support. Mm -hmm. I, I have no stake in the game if a student doesn't want to pursue anything beyond just getting some help for themselves, right? So. That's the most important piece and the, probably the place where we, between us, our office and you all, would intersect is that, right? Wanting that for our students. So um, always feel free to give us a call, even if you just have a hypothetical question. I, I work with a lot of faculty pretty much on a daily basis these days, mm -hmm. just answering questions around, what do you think? Do you think this was? Do you not? And at the end of the day, if you know something, you have to report it, but also always supplement that with, but let's get you to a resource center as well. Right. Yeah. And, I, and, and, and including Shaq, I'm sorry. Right, no, yeah. but I wanted to add about that because when Lisa talked about a student being in crisis, the gamut of crises, the range of issues that we see in students that we could not imagine years ago apply and so everything from students experiencing homelessness to being kicked out of the house to food insecurity to legal problems to mm -hmm. visa issues to right. you name it the source is with Lobo Respect that's the great place to start for any of those because the team as we will talk about as we go forth will get together to address you name it mm -hmm. um, so yes if you have a student struggling around anything one-stop shop, and we will address it with the gamut of resources we have available. And the Lobo Respect Advocacy Center, their web page is up to date, and it's really phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So um, the Lobo Respect Advocacy Center hosts the Lobo Food Pantry, which mm -hmm. provides um, students, staff, faculty, whomever, with up to three weeks of free food. It's offered once a month, so you can see the schedule on the, it's about three weeks, and it's really good yeah. food. Yeah. Um, and it's off, <laughs> you can see the schedule on their webpage. They have a list of shelters and resources for homelessness, for domestic violence, for free counseling, counseling. Um, 
for a, a variety of things. So even if you have a student in crisis and you're not sure if you want to call Lisa or the Advocacy Center, just exploring that web page and getting to know it is helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. are we ready? Do you have yeah. any questions for Lisa in particular? Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I'll talk yeah. about student health and counseling. Oh, go ahead. Some people came in a little late. Could you introduce yourselves again? Yes. Sure. Uh, my name is Nasha Torres, and I'm the Dean of Students here at the University. And I'm Stephanie McIver. I'm Director of Counseling at Student Health and Counseling. My name is Lisa Lindquist, and I am the Director of the Lobo Respect Advocacy Center. Okay, and I think I'll, can you hand me that? You guys are transitioning, I think I'll go. Is yeah. it about? Okay. And if something comes up around Lobo Respect, that I can, we'll, we I can, can answer it. it. Yeah. Nasha's got it. Yes, Nasha's got it. Okay, so I'm going to talk a, a bit about student health and counseling and where we come in in your experience of students in distress. And so let's see, do we have that? Okay. So let me just begin by saying student health and counseling is one department within the whole student health unit. We're an integrated health center. We have providers both on the medical and the counseling side that can address mental health issues. Uh, we have psychiatry. We can address any mental health issue. There was a time years ago when I began in collegiate health when we didn't handle really severe mental health issues um, like psychotic breaks. This is a developmental period where we start seeing students displaying the first signs of what may become a severe mental illness. And so we anticipate seeing that in a certain very small, thankfully, percentage of students. But whatever is occurring for students, we can address. That doesn't mean we will treat everything within our center, but we will begin with a triage. All students come into our service through a triage, which is a walk-in process. Any day between 10 and 4, all of us rotate on triage. Uh, and so if you have a student that you're concerned about, you can escort them over. You can give them information about how it works. But they walk into Shack, they put their name on an iPad, they get called up, and then they get to see a provider immediately. And we do a brief triage to assess what the uh, presenting issues are, how severe they are, and whether or not we need a crisis response whether or not there's another service that might be important for them, including administrative services it might begin to apply immediately. Um, so for example, in the case that Lisa brought up with um, <clears throat> sexual assault and the need for some administrative support. And so, well, let me see, how does that work? There we go, okay. So um, all the stresses that we're seeing, and I should say that what we're all experiencing on campus this term with what seems like this huge escalation in reports of distress and severity is not just anecdotal. Uh, in the last 24 hours, I've had conversations with my colleagues across the country where we're seeing you know, as much as a 30% increase in, in walk-ins and intakes in our services and more severe issues. Mm -hmm. And so it's very real. There was actually a, a terrific article in the New York Times earlier this week about the increase in anxiety in our youth. Mm -hmm. And that's the number one presenting issue to our service and to most other collegiate services across the nation, anxiety um, across the whole continuum of severity. Uh, so it's a number one problem. But what the stresses that, that come in and that we address from academic and work demands, group life and living. We deal with roommate conflicts that are interpersonal to even physical, um, uh, extracurricular and personal responsibilities may be what we attribute this increase to financial stresses, certainly social and interpersonal stressors. One of the things that we have determined is that students may actually be less skilled now the skills that we used to develop at an earlier age have been delayed somewhat. So there's a delay in leave from home, a delay in students wanting to drive, a delay in the acquisition of, of skills and resources that occurred much earlier for those of us in an older generation. And so students are coming to us in college without the ability or the resilience to handle this accumulation of responsibility and stress. And that may be why we're seeing this escalation. We also attribute it a lot to the overexposure to media and to social media, which we know initiates and perpetuates a lot of really inappropriate 
attitudes and behaviors, right? And so that becomes a problem and may explain in part why we're seeing this. But one of the things that we want you all as faculty to know is how to indicate or how to determine what's going on with students. So I think of it in terms of three categories. So people who are in distress, people who are disturbing, they disrupt your classroom environment and they create problems and issues for others. Distress may be relatively self-contained and you know that you have an individual who's going through something that is very personal and not shared, certainly not in a way that disrupts the environment. So I'd like you to think of those as, as two different levels, being distressed, being disturbing, and ultimately people who are threatening. Being disturbing is not necessarily being threatening. And we really need to learn how to distinguish those, and they come up a lot. So frequently we see people who are disturbing uh, being interpreted as being threatening, and so we really want to make that distinction. So uh, when we have a student who's in distress, you'll notice some things, a change in their performance, a change in their attendance, a change in the quality of their work. And there actually may be physical signs that they look like they're losing weight, like they're overly fatigued, um, that they're distracted. Um, the content of the work that they submit to you may have changed. Mm -hmm. And I think there are great signs and pretty valid flags that something is going on for them. And in that case, we recommend that when you uh, observe that, as soon as you observe that, you find a private moment to call them up, you know, after class or into one of your office hours to just say, I've noticed that things have changed with you. You know, you're not coming as frequently, the quality of your work, is everything okay? How can I help? Or what resources can I connect you to? So just observing that to them and saying, I notice, and saying, I know some resources that could be helpful to you is really important. In the case of disturbance, and that's where someone is acting out towards others, they're making the learning environment difficult, uh, they're saying things that scare other people. Um, that's where I think consultation, certainly with us and through a resource that we'll talk about in a minute called the BARC may come in, mm -hmm. and where conduct issues and violations of conduct code, not just a mental health concern, but also a behavioral concern comes in and where that becomes sort of an integration of the work that we do at Student Health and the work that the Dean of Students Office um, does. And so in the case of a, a student becoming disturbing, you know, certainly document those incidences and when Nasha talks, she'll direct you to a page where you can submit that. Threatening can either be a veiled or an overt statement that indicates a desire to do harm. And there's threatening toward oneself, but there's also threat toward others. And sometimes that can come in a, a kind of veiled way, no specific others, just others. I want to kill everybody. Um, and we don't know what that means. That's very different than saying, I want to kill you. That's a whole other thing, right? And it also, the difference gives us different recourse to address that. But it's really important <clears throat> when, uh, to be able to distinguish feeling threatened from being threatened. And so if you have any evidence, any documentation, any of that, any text messages that suggest that a student has you know, indicated, stated some veiled or overt desire to do harm, certainly contact us. And whether it comes first to the dean's office or to my office, we will respond to that. And sometimes we work together to analyze writing to determine, is it a threat or is it not a threat? Could it be construed a different way? Is it specific enough? And that's the work that we do. But I know, and I get calls every day from faculty members who are trying to distinguish, we have a disturbing student, are they in fact threatening? Mm -hmm. How they're behaving, is it an issue for themselves or is it an issue for us or for me as a faculty member? please consult with us about that so that we can help you distinguish that. 
Our website looks like this. I wanted to call attention to this, and we're trying to change it. We're not yet on board with the whole new model, but we're getting there. And you'll see to the left, there's a counseling services uh, menu. And under counseling services, again, this has been reconstructed a bit. But at the bottom of the, the set of links, it says ask a question. We have an ask a question form on the site that looks like this. And it has some um, uh, qualifiers on the side about emergencies, what to do. This is not a form to submit emergencies. But if you have a question, you can either call me at Shack to ask the question or you could submit it on a form. And you could say, you know, I have this student that's doing X. How might I think about it? Or could you call me to respond? And we will respond. Um, so that's available, and that's also available to members, other members of the community and to students to submit. So let me talk about my services, and then we'll hand it over to, to Nasha, since on here you see it has bark. Mm -hmm. So counseling services, you can call for consultation. Students can walk in for immediate services or triage. You can walk with them if you're a trusted person and they feel comfortable about that. Um, uh, we are confidential. So uh, as licensed healthcare providers, we're legally and ethically bound to maintain the confidence of the student. So if you refer someone over to us, we cannot uh, com um, what word am I looking for? Um, confirm. <laughs> we cannot confirm, right, that they've actually made it to us or that they've had an appointment. We will usually, if we know they've been referred by you, uh, suggest to the student that they let you know. But unless they sign a consent for release of information, we can't disclose uh, whether they've come to us uh, or certainly not the contents of the session. So you may not know, and I know that can be an anxiety-provoking position to be in, that you have someone who's disturbing and you've informed us, but you don't know what's happening with them. Um, and that's one of the, the rights to privacy that students have. Uh, we can do assessments, we do do treatment, and again, even medication treatment. Uh, we can hospitalize individuals if they require hospitalization. We do advocacy for accommodations, and that includes uh, with Accessibility Resource Center, if they have a chronic condition, or if they need a medical leave of absence or short-term absence, we work with the Dean of Students Office and local respect for that. We collaborate in care with other providers, mm -hmm. and we collaborate with everyone on the academic um, in administration, and we can on the academic side. So for example, we've had students who have severe illnesses, who have difficulty functioning, and who have agreed to sign a consent for release to work together with their advisor, or the chair of the department and with ARC, and we've gotten together as a team to talk about even scheduling classes for that student, given their condition, given their response to their medications, mm -hmm. we can do that. So um, so let me leave it there, and then I'll so hand talk it over about to Bark? you. And you can okay. talk about BARC. So I'm going to stand, just because I'm an antsy girl. Um, but how many of you have heard of behavior intervention, threat assessment, or BARC? Have you heard of it? OK. So. Um, what happened was when the Virginia Tech shooting happened, universities uh, nationwide started to rethink how we address to threatening or potentially dangerous situations. And what happened in that case um, was that individual had submitted some um, academic works and he had written some papers that were real disturbing. And the professor reported it to the chair and the chair reported it to the dean, but it stayed in that container, right? Then the student had stalked several different women on campus, and those women, one woman, one of them didn't report at all. One of them, the other two reported it to the police, and they were spread out, and it kind of stayed in that vacuum, right? Then um, the student was seen at a party stabbing a carpet, and some other students reported it, but it just didn't connect the dots, right? And then the student had put in um, a request to have a book published, and they denied the request, and um, then shortly thereafter, he came to campus and shot a bunch of people, right? Turns out, when they went back and they did a, a case debrief and really analyzed what had happened, and it, there's a, the FBI and the Department of Justice did some really interesting like case debriefs on that situation, what they realized was there were all these little markers of problems, right? But the university was so big, they hadn't connected the dots. So the current trend is that 
universities, businesses, um, even K through 12 schools should be doing threat assessment or behavior intervention. On our campus, we call it BARC. It's the Behavior Assessment Response Committee. Mm -hmm. um, and what it is, is it's an interdisciplinary team. So you'd have someone from student activities, someone from res life, someone from the dean of students office, someone from SHAC, someone from the police, um, so that someone from student employment. So with that if there is a student who's concerning or alarming, the university is looking at connecting the dots and figuring out, is this student in crisis? Are they having trouble? Could we reach out to them in meaningful ways to help them? Um, or is it just one instance where they weren't doing well? So the, the BARC committee has been around for a while, but we recently put a form up online where you can report incidents that are concerning or alarming. And, we've, and this was our first semester of putting the form online. Lots of universities have the form online. You can find it on our webpage at the Dean of Students webpage on, under reporting. Mm -hmm. But what we, we didn't think about was that faculty and staff needed training on this before the form <coughs> went live, right? Because what we have spent a lot of time doing this semester, my office in particular, is helping faculty and staff figure out, is this a bark incident? Like, is this actually a threatening incident? Is this, I'm going to be honest, a you incident, meaning you have a low threshold for anything weird? right? Or is this a classroom management incident where you guys need to, I'm going to be honest, handle your business? Or is this a code of conduct incident where you need to send it to me because it was really inappropriate behavior? So what, what I'm going to talk about is how to help you differentiate those things. And that's mutually beneficial, one, because you can sort it out in real time. And two, maybe I don't have to hold your hand later on if you don't need me to, right? So that's what the BARC does. That's where you can report it. We're going to talk about the differences between classroom behavior, conduct management, code of conduct, bark, and having you kind of check your own um, fears and thoughts too, right? Um, so is that, did you have more to present? Because I, well, can, I can yeah. finish I it think that's, I'll... yeah. So what are the statements about it and, and why bark exists? Um, but yeah. take it away. So here's, here's the catch. I'm going to start with BARC, because well, let's be honest, let's own who we are and where we are. There have been a lot of mass shootings in our country, and it's scary. And if you don't think it's scary, then you're not checked in. It's scary. Let's own that, right? One of the things that makes it scary is there aren't a lot of precursors that tell us whether or not we're in danger or we're not. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest and own that one of the things I'm coming to grips with is that in this day and age, a lot of it is chance, right? A lot of it is bad luck. Sometimes you can do something to prevent it, and sometimes you just go to church on Sunday and it wasn't your day, right? And we have to own that. So here are some things. If you're ever in a situation where you're like, I feel scared, and you, I feel really scared, you might be scared because you've had trauma in your life. You might be scared because you just had a family member pass away and you're feeling particularly vulnerable or raw. You might be scared because you have a huge threshold for scary stuff and this is scaring you, right? It doesn't matter why it's scaring you. If you're feeling that scared, you call the police. You don't call the dean of students office. You don't call me. And I tell you that like kind of funny but kind of true. All week, in fact, I just had a conversation with some professors and even deans where I was like, what, like, what do you really think if you're scared I'm going to do? Like walk over there in my heels, put on magic lipstick and save the day? Like, no, right? If you're that scared, call the police. So, a couple of things. On the back of your logo ID is the phone number to the police department, okay? Mm -hmm. It's also a phone number for a free escort service. So if you're ever walking somewhere on campus and you're just not really comfortable walking around at night or whatever the case may be, you can call for a free escort and they'll walk you wherever you need to go on campus. Mm -hmm. The other thing is the Lobo Guardian app. How many of you have heard of it? Okay, mm -hmm. so if you Google Lobo Guardian app, the UNM newsroom put instructions on how to find the app. I'm going to show you on my tiny little phone. Um, you can have the app open. I know you can't really see it, but you can have the app open like this when you're walking, and you can set a timer so you have a buddy on campus. Let's say, let's say you're working late, you're in the building and you're working late. You can have a buddy in the building so they know when you leave and you're communicating. 
you can set it, like sometimes I set it so my husband knows if I'm working late when I leave the office, and he knows more or less how long it takes me to get home, and an alarm will go off on his phone if I haven't gotten home yet, right? You can also, what's kind of cool, is you can call 911 immediately just by touching that, and you can send a tip. So if you see someone that's kind of hanging out near some bikes and they look like they shouldn't be there and you're pretty sure they might steal it, you can send a tip and it allows you to take a picture and it goes immediately to UNMPD with the location. So it's pretty cool and it's free and you can download that. Um, and I don't, Sorry, yeah, Lobo Guardian app. And if you're in the app store, sometimes it's Rave, R-A-V-E, Guardian. That's the national brand and our version is Lobo Guardian. If you Google it and you're not tech savvy, they'll give you the directions so you can put it on your phone easier, right? Because that's what I had to do. Um, so that's the first thing. I will never tell you that your fears aren't legitimate. I will never tell you, like, this isn't right. If, but I will tell you that we have to be clear about who does what, right? If you're immediately scared for whatever reason, you call the police. If it was weird and you're not sure if you're scared, but it didn't seem right and you're not 100% sure what to do with that, you can talk to Shaq. You can call Stephanie and talk to Shaq to do some assessment. You can submit a BARC report and the BARC team will talk about it. We meet once a week. Um, you can call the Dean of Students Office if you think it's like a code of conduct violation and you can talk to one of our conduct officers and we'll walk you through that. But hopefully this presentation will help you decide for which pile it goes into. So this, this document is a little out of date but it's still awesome so I brought it. Dr. MacGyver actually developed this with our former conduct officer and it's how to manage classroom behavior. That's where we're going to start. I'm not going to present this document to you. I'm just going to hand it out so you have it, right? It's also available online. Um, there is a class for those of you that are GAs or TAs, there is a class that Erin Haney offers through CAPS about classroom behavior management. And you, if I were you, I'd go. Remember I told you I'd tell you like what my book of training would be. I talked to you about LGBTQ safe zone. I talked to you about trans 101, I talk to you now about, I would go to that class. So her schedule will be up online and I would just go to understand it. One of the things that professors, yes, yes, CAPS, you know, CAPS the, in the library that does the tutoring for students, they offer a class for GAs and TAs on classroom management, and behavior management in the classroom. Let's go through some examples of what that might look like. And then I'll go through some, some of your options, because Professor always like, I'm going to drop this guy. So let's talk about that. <laughs> OK. So if you have a student, let's say you're discussing something really intense, like you're discussing race, you're discussing politics, you're discussing women's rights, you're discussing sexual assault, you're discussing um, gun laws. Yes, gun laws. I mean, anything controversial, mm -hmm. right? Let's remember that students, and you all know this, students have a right to free speech. So they get to express their opinions. You also know this, that undergraduate students are in a developmental phase where they kind of see things a little bit in black and white, right? So I look back at my 18-year-old version of myself on this campus, and I was like a, a hardcore activist, and I had all these opinions about things, mm -hmm. and I told everybody what they were. Mm -hmm. And then over time, it's kind of evolved in some ways, right? But these students, they're in this developmental phase where they're still really into it and they're figuring out what their beliefs are, they're figuring out how to communicate it, they're figuring out how to discuss it in an academic way or in a debate where you can exchange ideas where you don't agree. Mm -hmm. And you may never agree, but the point is, one of the cool things about college and the environment we provide is that it's an opportunity for them to hear different viewpoints and to have that discussion. Different people have different comfort levels with those discussions. Mm -hmm. So one of the tips that I've heard from very seasoned professors is that they don't go down that path unless they're sure they can help control that discussion in that environment and create a space where people don't feel targeted or where people don't feel isolated on whatever their viewpoint may be. And I, I'm not a professor and I won't tell you how to do that because I don't know. But you should talk to some more seasoned professors, people who have engaged in those conversations for years to figure out how to set that up at the beginning. And the number one tip is lay ground rules at the beginning of what's okay and what's not okay and when it crosses the line. If you don't, 
I can almost guarantee that you're going to have a slew of OEO complaints. And or, and or you may be in a position where you feel like it got really out of control and you're offended and you're angry and you want me to take some kind of conduct action because a student didn't agree with you. Now, for those of you that might think, that sounds crazy, I would never do that. That's a pretty frequent thing in my office. Mm -hmm. I have faculty members contact us probably at least twice a week mm -hmm. saying the student was offensive because they said fill in the blank, not because they cursed, not because they were um, disrespectful of space or authority. It was the content of what they said. So, because we are a public institution and we receive public money, the basics of the free speech rights are the university can control time, place, and manner, not content. So if you have a student that says something to you that the content really bothers you and really upsets you, then I just encourage you to walk through this like basic analysis of kind of free speech and where you are in it. Because even though you're the professor and they're the student, there's still two parties to every conflict or every conversation. So you might want to check, check in with yourself on where you are in that conversation and where you are in like your life and your viewpoints and your development and what's leading into you engaging in this environment, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what. So if a student says something to you that you think is politically offensive, it's not a code of conduct violation, more than likely. <coughs> the difference is, is if a student, for example, were to stand up, get into your personal space, cuss, yell, physically intimidate you, scare you, right? Make you uncomfortable or just behave in a way that's completely inappropriate for a student to treat a teacher. Then it's a code of conduct issue, right? I've had a lot of professors contact me and say, I heard a student, I heard from other students that this guy, I'll just call it Bob or Bob, but Bob had gotten mad last weekend and, and thrown a trash can and said curse words. And so I say, okay, did you see it, right? Because think about the game of telephone that I think you probably played in elementary, where if we all, if I told Stephanie a secret and she said it by the time it got to the end of the room, it would be something totally different, right? Mm -hmm. So did you see it? Like, do you know that for sure, right? If you don't know it for sure, take it with a grain of salt. You can report it to my office, sure. But don't, I've had student, I've had professors, a lot of professors, I'm not making this up, say they're freaked out about their safety because they heard that a student had yelled at someone else the weekend before. Mm -hmm. This is where I'm encouraging you to kind of like put your, think about yourself too, right? Like, I don't know if that's reasonable. So I go through this analysis with professors. I'm like, okay, what about that freaked you out? Then maybe they say something like, well, when he's talked to me, he's raised his voice and he's leaned into me and he seems to have zero respect for my position as a professor. Mm -hmm. Well, that's different. Right? That changes the analysis a little bit. If a student does something in class that's disruptive, you as faculty members or professors have the ability to kick them out of that class. Right? You lay ground rules. You say that's not appropriate. You say, Bob, please leave. This is not, that is not appropriate classroom behavior. Perfect. Please tell Bob, this is going to sound crazy, but use your words, as I tell my children, <laughs> but use your words and tell him, that is not appropriate. This is why. This is where I outlined it at the beginning of the class. You cannot behave that way and continue to remain in my class. That, your tone, the way you pointed your finger at that other student, point out the behavior, call out the behavior and say what was wrong with it. I can't tell you how many conduct cases we have that when we're looking into them, I say, well, did anyone ever tell this person that that was inappropriate or that you're making me uncomfortable or you're making other students uncomfortable? And they're like, well, well no, we just, we, we, we just didn't, we didn't know how to have that conversation. You have to have the conversation. If it's like, it's something that you feel safe doing, you have to have the conversation. People, can I, can, yeah, please. Can I um, interject there that it's important for us to be able to determine whether or not you're dealing with a student who has the skill of insight, right? That, that if their attention is called to a behavior, they go, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was doing that, or I didn't realize that my facial expression was that way. And most students don't want to be in trouble. And we need to be able to differentiate those types of students from the students who frankly don't give a damn. You could tell them a thousand times, and they will continue to engage in the behavior. Now, we don't want it to go a thousand times. It could just be like two or three. Yeah. But the point is, is that you want to be able to distinguish between 
the students that are responsive to your request that their behavior change and that they have insight into it and those who do not have that ability that's a whole nother thing right yeah excellent excellent um so then i've had professors say well this student is consistently a problem and i want to drop them from my class right i'm going to drop them from my class and as far as i know there is not anything that allows you to drop a student from a class for behavior issues so i know i know so let's talk about it right you can drop the faculty handbook and other policies at the university talk about how you can drop a student for lack of attendance they talk about how you can drop a student because they didn't participate the way your syllabus mandates um, and a lot of times those conduct issues go hand in hand with those issues so think about that the reason why i think the reason why faculty don't have the ability to drop a student from a class unilaterally just for behavior issues is because students have a constitutional right to their education and if you're going to take that education away you're required to give them due process and that means usually that goes through my office right because we're we, this is what we do um, it means essentially that they have to know the evidence against them the ability to respond to it and the opportunity to appeal and if you drop them from the class that due process chain doesn't exist however if they had a serious conduct infraction and they were suspended or expelled from the university from my office we have a whole process in the student grievance procedure that due process rights are preserved and they exist. Under Regent policy, any issue impacting the student's constitutional right to education can be appealed all the way to the Regents. So think about that. If you drop a student from your class, let's say it's a mandatory class that they need for graduation, the student would make the argument that you're you know, denying them the right to their education without due process. So it doesn't mean that if you have a consistently problematic student, you're just stuck. It means that if you have a consistently problematic student, you can refer to the dean of student's office and we'll look at it and see what we can do. Usually, if a student has behavior problems in one class one time and you tell them, like Stephanie said, you tell them to get right, especially when it's coming from the dean of student's office, they almost always do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when they don't, it's because they're having problems in a lot of other areas and it's beyond just what you're seeing. So I want to talk to you, part of what the Dean of Students Office does is we do not only conduct, but we, our conduct office is called Student Rights and Responsibility. So I want to talk to you a little bit about student rights. First one is confidentiality. I'm sure all of you have had FERPA training, right? Yes, have you had FERPA training? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, okay, good, mm -hmm. no? Okay, if you haven't, <laughs> you should. Um, so here's FERPA. FERPA is a federal law um, and it pr protects students' confidentiality in an education environment. Faculty members, you can talk to me, for example, about a student without violating FERPA because we're within the same educational institution, one, and two, I have a legitimate educational interest in knowing that information, right? You could talk to other people in the university about a student's conduct, but FERPA does not protect gossip. FERPA does not protect you venting because you had a bad day. So FERPA does not protect you saying, hey, one of my good friends is an English professor and she's been teaching a lot longer than me. I'm going to tell her all about Bob and the details of what's going on so she can give me advice. FERPA doesn't protect that, meaning that would be a breach of federal law and that student's confidentiality rights. However, you can scrub the information when you talk to your friend. For example, instead of saying Bob and this is his last name and this is what classes I have him in, right? You can say, I have a student who's having these trouble, having these problems. This is what I'm encountering with the problems. What tips do you have for me to fix it? That's cool under FERPA. That's mm -hmm. okay. You can do that. FERPA does not protect you talking to your spouse about it. Mm -hmm. And I say this because we've seen that problem happen a lot where a professor had a weird incident with a student and they go home and they tell their spouse, spouse Googles the student and is all of a sudden emailing the chair about their past criminal history. Not cool. Yes? So in that case, if you scrub the information, is that okay with your spouse or not? Potentially, yes. So what FERPA covers is what's called personally identifiable information. Mm -hmm. That's name, uh, banner ID, but it's also, and here's the catchy one, a collection of factors that would lead a reasonable person in the school community 
to know the identity of the student. Correct. So the example that I give all the time is when my daughter was little, I always combed her in two piggies because I'm not creative. And if you saw a picture of the classroom and you saw the back of her head, you would know if you know that classroom and you know that school, that that's Luna. You would know because of the mm -hmm. piggies, right? Dead giveaway. So think about that when you're thinking about collection of factors, reasonable person in the school community. If you have a cohort of five students, people will be more likely to know who that student is, even if you don't say the name, or you say B instead of Bob because you think you're being clever. Or you say, um, you know, I have this student in biochem from Burundi. Okay, seriously, there can only be one. <laughs> you know, we all know who that is, right? Right. Yeah. So think about how much you scrub it with the personally identifiable information. Then the next thing I would tell you is part, why do we do that? Like why? Think about Bob. You may think that Bob is having a really hard time. You may decide because you have a, a first cousin that's bipolar that Bob is becoming bipolar. And so you may talk to his other professors and say, hey, I think Bob is really showing signs of being bipolar. Okay, one, you're not his doctor, so don't diagnose, right? Two, what if that's not the case? What if Bob's mom just died, right? So, or what if Bob was just having a really bad day? Or what if Bob had just been sexually assaulted, right? They don't, they don't need compounding problems by us working out our problems, right? So that's, that's one. Two is, when I talk about student rights, um, the other thing that I'm gonna talk about is the student grievance procedure, which if you don't know, you ought to know. Um, pull it up. Have it on your desk as a reference manual. Students have the right to say that a professor treated me poorly and I didn't like it. And they can report that to the chair. They, can, they come and they talk to me about it too, right? Um, and that in the student grievance procedure, they have rights to challenge grades. So let's say uh, Bob's behavior is impacting his participation grade in the class and is causing him to flunk the course. That's a separate issue than the code of conduct, right? That's an academic issue. And there's a different academic appeal process, which is Article 2, versus conduct, which is Article 3, right? So a lot of times I've had professors say, well, I'm angry because Bob is complaining about the way I'm treating him, but no one is listening to me about the way Bob is treating me. Um, that's an issue that you can take up with your chair and you can think about, but I would encourage you and is that, and what I've said so much this week, and I think it's a, a, a perfect analogy, is we are the pace cars, right? We are the, we, our personality, our tone, our vibe, how we approach the situation is going to set the environment. So if Bob starts to escalate and I escalate, he's going to escalate. If Bob starts to escalate and I go real calm and I lower my tone and I slow my cadence, and I'm super chill, and I listen to what he has to say, and I say, yeah, I understand where you're coming from, and then I can you know, go home and drink wine and freak out or whatever, but you're the pace car. So when you start to be like, oh my God, who's not listening to me, and how is this happening? It's gonna increase the tension in the environment. So, I mean, I, those would be my tips, just basic tips about how that works. If you have a consistent problem with the student, tell us. Tell us via the BARC report. You can tell us for student conduct. If you Have any of you ever read the Code of Conduct for Students? Mm -hmm. Have any of you ever read the Student Grievance Procedure? Okay, so put that in your, it's like reading serial instructions, but just put it in your <laughs> to-do list for the next two years. You may not ever need it, but I know that those faculty members that are familiar with it, I hear from a lot less. Um, because a lot of times, They'll think it's a code of conduct infraction. It's not. They haven't read the code of conduct. They take it to me for a code of conduct infraction. I tell them it's not. And then they feel very isolated and they feel unsupported. But if they knew the rules going into it, they might better understand when it is and when it isn't. So don't think that I'm telling you that students have a right to be disrespectful to you. They don't. That's a violation of the code of conduct. Send it to the conduct officer in my office, right? They don't have the opportunity or the ability or the right to disrupt your class that you can't teach. They don't have the right to scare you or make you uncomfortable. Um, but those are some of the gray areas that you're going to encounter if you haven't already. Right. Yeah. I, about that, whether or not it's our issue or an issue of the, a conduct issue, we had a case about a student who allegedly used profanity in the department and the faculty member was disturbed by that and said, we have a rule in the department that 
we can't use profanity or in the class. So it became an issue about whether or not the professor's own mores around language mm -hmm. applies. And that's not a violation of the code of conduct. Students get to cuss whether it offends us or not, and but not at you. So there was a, a difference between using the F word or saying F you. There's a difference, right? And, and you can, I mean, you're, you're going to decide if, let's say it's a paper, they're submitting a paper. You're, one of the things that we're teaching students at this university is not just how to be a good mathematician or a good scientist, but we're teaching them how to be good employees and good citizens and good people, right? You can't submit, I can't write an email on a professional list serve to <coughs> Stephanie or anyone else and drop a bunch of F-bombs. That's not professional, not cool. I'd get fired for that, right? So you have to, part of it is telling them and walking them through those professional standards. And I, I think that what Dr. MacGyver was saying earlier is true, is that what we're seeing in this generation is there's a little bit of a, a delay in how quickly they've learned these lessons. Um, it, sidebar, but I just finished binge watching Stranger Things. Who's done that? I have done right. that. So yes. I'm a product of the 80s, and it's a trip because yes. the parents are just like, where's my kid for a exactly. whole day? And I'm like, <laughs> right, that was the 80s, but that's not right. how it works now, right? right. Start with parents, then we'll go online because that mm -hmm. leads to another topic, too, I'd like to discuss. So parents, um, parents are having a hard time letting go. And, and, okay, cool, I'm not, I'm not here to judge you. I don't know your life. But they're having a hard time letting go. And FERPA applies with parents, too. So K through 12, they've been all up in their kids' business. They know everything. They talk to every teacher. They advocate for how wonderful their child is, et cetera, right? In college, that no longer applies. All FERPA student confidentiality rights transfer to the student. So you don't talk to parents unless you have a FERPA waiver. And I had a student who came in and he had a conduct issue. He came to see me to tell me how unjust it was. And he says, I, I want you to call my mom. And I said, no. <laughs> and he says, well, I want you to. And I said, you're not the boss of me and you're a grown man and I'm not calling your mom. And he says, well, I'll sign a FERPA waiver so she can call you. And I said, let me make this clear. Me talking to your mom, one, I'm not spending more than 15 minutes with her because I have things to do. Two, me calling your mom isn't changing anything. This conduct action isn't changing. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to explain myself to her. You broke the rules. The rules apply. You can explain that to your mom and then she can call me. Or I can set up a 15-minute phone conversation with your mom and I'm happy to say that. Then I go to Marble Brewery that weekend and I see his 19-year-old butt at the bar. So I walk up to him and I was like, hey, you want me to call your mom? <laughs> you just left the bar so fast, but it's like it's so turkey, right? Meeting, I mean, the, the, these are real stories, right? Exactly. So when you're talking about parents, feel free to not only set boundaries with FERPA, but push back on the student and say, hey, you're an adult now. You're in college. Like, you've got to start navigating these things on your own. And feel free to check your time and say, I'm not spending an hour on the phone with your upset mom. Yes? What about the other way around? The parents contact you. But then you tell them I don't have a FERPA waiver, I can't talk I to can't you. I can't touch you. You can't even really confirm that he's in your class. Right. And, and I want to say something about that, yeah. too. We've done more and more in the summertime with participation and orientation and talking to parents. Parents yes. come through. It's important that they know that their kids have a health service and all that kind of stuff. But in that messaging, they seem to have developed the impression that they can have their child sign a general consent for release of information so that if they come to student health, we'll just call them and say, your child showed up for a gynecological exam, right. and here's what we found. <laughs> I veto, like every release of information comes through me, I veto all such general parental releases, and I will call the student and I'll tell them why. Because we consider you an adult, you have agency, if there's something your parents need to know, you can tell them. Now, if there's a reason why we need to disclose to them, there are some medications that if you're a minor, they have to you know, know about it. If they're being hospitalized, if they're in emergency contact, et cetera. If we have to coordinate care, but not general. So yes, yeah, sometimes a student will say that, and I'll call them and I'll say, no, we're not going to do that. And here's why. So the only way that the parents can bother you 
this they they sign the FERPA, uh, if the kids sign the FERPA. And even, even then, look what the FERPA form even does, then. read it. So go to the office of the registrar mm -hmm. and look at forms, and then go to the FERPA proxy, it's called, right? right? And if you read that form, all it does is allow the parent access to educational records. It doesn't mean you have to call and explain yourself to his mom. Right. No and, way. and usually it has to be specific. On our yeah. releases, it has to be specific regarding medication issues, regarding hospitalization. Conduct. Not a general, oh, they showed up today. We're not doing general releases to involve parents in care because we do expect that at this point in students' lives, they begin to handle that aspect of their, you know, of their life and responsibilities themselves. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was just going to make the added point, be really careful with email. We've seen that. a couple of evidences of parents having access to their kids' UNM email, and email and a faculty member or department chair, either with their own name through their kids' email or as their kid. Can, can I add one more piece about email? Email, your email to anyone else about a student is an education record under FERPA, and that student has the right to that education record with zero redactions. So be really, really careful. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, right. If you want to email a colleague about how terrible Bob is, that's a bad idea. Pick up the phone. And even if you want to email me to talk about a student, it's okay to use email. I don't need the name. I don't need any identifying information. If, the, if you wanted us to look at an email to determine is this a threat or is it not a threat, you can redact all, because I don't need to know who the student is. Um, and, and in that case, you can send it. Yes, question in the back. Mm -hmm. it, part of the reason why I happen to know so much about FERPA is before I became the dean, I was an attorney for 10 years um, and did education law specifically for six. So I know a lot about that, but that's not really my question to answer. So I, what I would do is I would encourage you to contact the office of the registrar because they, the office of the registrar, and I used to know this, by the way, when I was a legal advisor, if they called me with the FERPA question, it was a doozy, because they have, they are so knowledgeable, and they are the university subject matter expert um, for all of you on it, and I want to create, like, good muscle memory in this training. So what I would do is I would contact the office of the registrar, and I would just ask your question for your future reference, and they'll explain the best practices for the university. I will say in terms of health records, a family member may know, for example, that they saw us and so call to me and say, I want to know what happened. Even in a case of a client or patient death, we cannot disclose that information. It belongs to whoever the executor is and we have to wait until that's defined by a, a court if that's not obvious in those proceedings. So that happens sometimes because people know my child or my spouse or my brother is going to student health and they died. I think I should know what happened. We can't disclose right. that. So that, your question raises a really good point that I did want to talk to you about today and that's suicide mm -hmm. um, and suicide prevention and suicide ideology. Mm -hmm. So this, I would say the last two semesters we have seen a, a sharp increase in suicide ideation um, and suicide risk. And all um, forms of self-harm. And all forms of self-harm. Yeah. It's been intense. So um, Agora, I'm telling you about all the other trainings you should do. Agora, which is a crisis line started on campus, they had an excellent suicide um, prevention and like issue spotting training that they did um, for Suicide Aware Prevention and Awareness Day, which was like a couple months ago, they had classes that they offered for faculty, staff, and students. Um, but you can have them come in, you can sign up for one online, it's free, or you could have them come in and do one for your department, and I highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. So they just gave some really good tips about how to, you know, spot issues, how to support students that are struggling, what to say after a student may have committed suicide. Um, and they really were the experts in that. So one of the sheets I planned on bringing, but I didn't make enough copies, was their little one, Agora's one pager mm -hmm. on suicide prevention and suicide ideology. But you can find that on their webpage, and I highly recommend that training. Mm -hmm.
So if you think about it, if you went to all the trainings I just told you about, it's probably five hours of your life, truly, and you would be much better equipped for the current position that you have being frontline with students. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a, a, a department called Accessibility Resource Center. The director is Joan Green. She's phenomenal. Yes. Um, and if a professor gets a notice of an accommodation from the Accessibility Resource Center, that's how you should be notified that the student has some kind of issue going yeah, on. but not for research. But, but they, and they notified me only when student, because he was in my class, decided that's how it will decide. That's, but, the, that's the federal law in the United yes, States. But, um, so let me explain the process, because maybe if I explain the law and like how the process works, it'll give you some understanding of why it feels a little strange to you. In, in K-12 education, the law that applies this idea that Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act, it requires that schools identify the disabilities or students that are struggling, figure out the appropriate accommodations, and then provide a free appropriate public education to that student. In higher education, it shifts. An idea is no longer applicable. The laws are the Americans with Disabilities Act and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Mm -hmm. What those laws require is that students must self-identify. So if I had a bunch of learning disabilities my whole life, by the way, they don't go away, but when I get to college, I decide they're no longer applicable, they're not hurting me, I don't want anyone to know that I'm dyslexic, I'm not going to ask for help, that's on me. The school doesn't get to say, hey, Nasha, UNM doesn't get to say, hey, Nasha, we think that you're dyslexic and you can't write a paper at all to save your life. We have real concerns about you being an English major, not an option. Mm -hmm. They don't get to diagnose me. They don't get to tell me what accommodations I need. That's on me as an adult for disclo to disclose and to decide what help I need. How that works is I go to my, my medical professional and I say, let's say I have a mental health disability and I want to do research. I go, let's say I'm on the spectrum, that's a, that's a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Let's say I'm on the autism spectrum, and I want to be a researcher, and I want to work in a lab. I go to my medical professional, and they know what my diagnosis is, and they know what the limitations or the, you know, the benefits are, how, how my disability manifests in certain environments. I talk to them about the program, and me and my medical professional, in a confidential conversation, figure out what accommodations I need to be successful at UNM. Then I take that to ARC, the Accessibility Resource Center, and ARC and I talk about it. And ARC says, hey, we discussed it with the department. And for example, it requires, um, let's not say autism, let's say a physical disability. Sorry, I keep changing the hypothetical. But let's say it requires, the research requires a certain dexterity, a physical dexterity with my hands that because of my disability I don't have. The program is not required under federal law to change the essential functions of the program. They are not required by federal law to fundamentally alter the program, meaning to figure out some way to have an assistant come in and figure out how to do this motion for me, right? However, the federal law requires that if the program can make a reasonable accommodation, like maybe it wouldn't be too disruptive and it wouldn't be too hard on UNM to hire someone to come and do this motion for me every now and then, right? Then the university has the requirement and obligation under federal law to do that. If the university were to tell you, the research professor, what my disability is, what it means, how it looks, so you could explain it to everyone else in the program, that's a violation of federal law and it would impact the student's confidentiality rights, and it would impact the program. So I know it can be a little frustrating and scary as the professors who are overseeing that program to say, oh, do I, do I, what do I do? I don't have a lot of control over this. You don't. But Joan is an expert, and the people that advise Joan and how they work on the documentation, they're experts. Mm -hmm. So they, if it doesn't work, they tell you. And there's, there are cases that I've seen where they tell the student, there's no way we could provide a reasonable accommodation for you to participate in the program unless we were to fundamentally alter the program, which we can't do. So I know that that can be frustrating, but the truth is, is under federal law, there's just a lot of times you won't know. Do you want right. to add? I do want to add, because I had to consult with Joan this week about students and their, their rights under ADA. And we advocate for students to go on medical leave and help them make decisions about whether or not they're well enough to return. And in the case of graduate students who are not just taking classes, being students, they may also be teaching 
and they may be um, doing research, and in the case of this particular student, all three. And the condition currently is affecting all three, so we have to make a decision about whether or not the student's ready to do all three. They're separate things. So I consulted with Joan about permitting students to come back piecemeal. What if they can only do one of those things, come back and take classes? Can we help them gradually get back into their graduate studies? And she responded by saying, our office, Accessibility Resource Center, only handles academic related issues to the student's degree program. So we would be able to provide accommodations for slowly returning to classes, extending that degree program, adding in research as is appropriate and determined by ARC and what that student can do in a research environment. But teaching is an employment issue handled through the Office of Equal Opportunity. So she would take a part of that and help the student determine if the condition precludes them from completing all the requirements for their classes and for their research, uh, but not for teaching. Those are separate things. And so if their provider suggests that they're ready to do research and they don't have a condition that should preclude that and ARC believes that it could be accommodated, we must accommodate them. The, the last thing I would add is that you as employees of the university don't get to say you won't work with someone with a disability. You know, that's not within your employment rights because the Americans with Disabilities Act requires that if the institution can provide an accommodation for a student, they have to, and that means you. Mm -hmm. So I've had some people say, well, I'm, I'm really afraid of people who may have mental health disabilities and I can't do this. Well, then this, this may not be the job for you. Um, because that's part of the job. So the, the other piece I'll add about disabilities is there is no accommodation <coughs> for behavior issues. So there's no accommodation for behavior issues. So if you have someone that has persistent behavior issues and they don't seem to understand the rules of the university or how they have to comport themselves in our environment, there's no accommodation for that. There's no disability you know, thing that you could say, like, hey, well, I'm you know, on the spectrum, so it's okay that I punch that guy. It's not. Mm -hmm. um, so conduct, the rules of co the code of conduct still applies. Um, it just slight, it makes the analysis a little bit more complicated. Right, or if they say in a research environment, I have memory issues, so I don't remember that I'm not supposed to turn on this flame, or I don't remember that I'm not supposed to use protective equipment. Okay, no. Doesn't work. That puts other people in danger. Right. It That's work. another issue. But if you have that level of problem, please, Consult with ARC, amazing resource. Just consult mm -hmm. with them, talk it through. They will be your subject matter expert in that department. Yeah, and I never got to your online question. So yes. Was, yeah, okay, yeah. thanks for bringing it back. So, <clears throat> online. So, I see less conduct issues with online classes. That's the fundamental issue. I think people have a harder time. There's more conduct cases when it's in-person interaction. Um, mm -hmm. I have seen with online class. well, not with online classes, but there has been, in inappropriate communication um, part there's inappropriate communication with all kinds of technology things in our university and that's because if you work at all with students you know that the majority of their communication is like that right mm -hmm. so and then they 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 do all kinds of dumb things like you know document every bad decision they make and post it publicly but that's on them they'll figure that one out um, <laughs> but but we see, so we see a bunch of cyberbullying, um, and the general rule with that is that, and, or with conduct that occurs off campus, but it, it, it bleeds into the university environment via technology, if your off-campus behavior impacts the university community and the learning environment, then the Dean of Students Office likely has jurisdiction. So let's say your, um, oh, these are all real stories. Your, uh, you're, you're so proud of yourself because you're 19 and you got a handle of vodka, so you're going to take pictures of yourself and all your buddies drinking in the dorms, right? Or you're not in the dorms, uh, you're somewhere else and you're taking pictures of you driving and drinking a beer because you think that's awesome. Um, those are all things that could be subject to the code of conduct.